identified more than 700 varieties of Australian wildflowers. Flowers like the red spider, this colorful grotesque kangaroo paw, Even the sandy plains of the arid interior produced floral beauty. And of course, there was the wattle, the soft, golden bald wattle, in dazzling brilliance from one end of the continent to the other. A golden wattle that has since become the emblem of the nation. There was colorful splendor too in the rough, stalwart gum tree. Some of Australia's wildflowers are in bloom throughout the year, but the gum trees are spring flowering trees that make the Australian bush in springtime a fairyland of color. And they have more than beauty, for they provide the wealth of Australia's great hardwood industry. There are strange animals too, animals from a lost world like this wallaby and these kangaroos. Weird tales of animals that nurse their young in pouches, like this mother, caused grave doubts about the sanity of the settlers when some told their stories in England. And who would believe tales of an animal that could bound 20 feet at a stride and travel like the wind, even if it was only a 40 mile an hour wind? And teddy bears that were not toys but could breathe and eat and climb trees too. The koala, to give him his right title, is probably the most universally loved of Australia's animal oddities. He lives only on the leaves of a few special types of eucalypts, doesn't drink at all, and is generally nocturnal in its. And the platypus, a strange animal that lays eggs but suckles its young. The birds were as strange as the animals. Cheerful fellows like the kookaburra with his eerie early morning laugh. And the raucous cheeky white cockatoo. There were ducks of many varieties. And long before the settlers came, explorers had been ridiculed for their stories about a black swan. The Dutch explorer, de Vlaeming, told it first in 1697 and named the Swan River because of them. The black swan today has a permanent place on Western Australia's coat of arms. The sea too held its wonders for the pioneers. Coral, a coral reef stretching 1,250 miles along the northeastern coast, with underwater life as strange as that of the land. conquered the land. Houses like these, hewn from the earth's stone and its timbers, sheltered them. New settlers came in a growing stream. They cleared the forests, tilled the soil, and grew their grain. A rich dairying industry was born, and the settlement prospered. But men reached out ever further and accepted the challenge of the unconquered mountain range. The Blue Mountains barrier was crossed, and to the westward, the pioneers found the wide, rolling plains that today carry the bulk of Australia's wheat and sheep lands. Let us look at a typical field where the golden heads of wheat are to be harvested for their grain. Most Australian wheats are of high quality, rust-resistant varieties, the result of early research by the immigrant pioneer, William James Farrer. While Farrer experimented with his grain, Australian-born Hugh Victor Mackay experimented with farm machinery that today leads the world in design and accomplishment. The son of a poor farmer, Mackay, when he was 18, made his first reaper and winnower out of kerosene cans and metal scraps. He called it sunshine. The sunshine reaper and header, today known the world over, 
completes in one operation the harvesting, thrashing, and bagging. Australia is one of the world's largest wheat producers and exporters. Giant elevators dot the foreshores of most major Australian ports. From them, grain pours directly to the holds of ships. Grain feeds the people of Europe and India. Wheat has helped to build hundreds of healthy, prosperous townships like this one, Gundagai. And it wasn't only wheat that built them. For with the mountain barriers conquered, Pioneers pushed farther out and brought with them cattle. Men like these are the drovers who tend the vast herds to the north, in the northwest, and in Queensland. Scenes like these, taken through the dust fog stirred by the feet of the stumbling herd, are still typical of any outback area when cattle are on the move. The Australian Aborigine has proved to be a natural horseman, and he excels as a stockman or cowboy. But the real wealth of Australia lay, and still lies, in a veritable golden fleece. Her sheep, normally about 120 million of them, for Australia has more sheep than any other country. The country's prosperity is built up in the fleeces of the flocks that stock Australia's vast sheep belt, and which are mustered each season for shearing. So, from the paddock to the shed, where razor-sharp shears are made ready for the clip. Today, most shearing is done by machine, but old-timers still talk of the days when Jimmy Powers shore 315 sheep in a little over seven hours. For the sheep, it's back to the fields. For Australia, it's a billion-dollar check. And there is wealth in the sea, too. The deep blue waters teem with fish of all varieties. Little trawlers off the shore and big trawlers out at sea bring in daily cargoes. Many varieties are there in shoals. Unexploited hordes of tuna abound, which today are closely engaging the attention of state and federal authorities. Did I say these waters teemed with fish? Just watch these men trolling. Each man has at least three lines out, and you'll notice that his only worry is getting them in fast enough. Think it over, Dad, next time you're sitting an hour waiting for a bite. Thus the sea and the land yield their natural riches, which are the background to Australia's cities, like Adelaide, capital of South Australia. Laid out in 1837 by Colonel William Light, Adelaide is an everlasting tribute to the foresight of its planner. With its wide streets and stately spires, it houses one of Australia's best known universities and is regarded by many as the nation's cultural center. And in the hills that roll back from the city's outskirts, orchards flourish, and springtime adds its colorful touch to the trees. And just 60 miles south of Adelaide, the waters of Australia's greatest inland waterway, the Murray River, pour into the sea. The Murray is about 1,500 miles long, and with its many tributaries, drains an area larger than Spain and France combined. Great walls of masonry and concrete hold back precious waters for thirsty land and open up new territories. And as time went on, there were new harvests to reap. Grapes, grapes for wine, grapes for the table, grapes for raisins too. Australia's been able to meet all her own dried fruit requirements since 1912. And since that time, she has built up a healthy export market. After drying on racks, the grapes go through another drying process on ground mats. And then, well, haven't you ever had fruitcake? But not all Australian fruit is grown to be dried. 
There are fruits of every kind in abundance. Pineapples, for instance. Most of Australia's pineapples come from the tropic state, Queensland, which produces almost every known variety of tropical fruit as well. Australians are prolific fruit eaters, and it's small wonder. Their country is entirely self-supporting in citrus fruits, too. Oranges, for instance, are grown extensively in orchards like this in almost every state. The irrigation areas alone have almost 150,000 acres under fruit trees of various kinds. Cherries, peaches, pears, and apples are produced in abundance. Most of Australia's fruit growing areas are comparatively handy to the main markets. Australia's great industrial growth has been centered around cities like Melbourne. Melbourne lies in a setting of man-made parks and gardens that give a distinctive charm. Its wide streets, like Collins Street, are mostly tree-lined. Melbourne is Australia's second largest city, with a population of a million and a quarter. Its central suburb station at Flinders Street is the terminal for all suburban lines. During peak hours, Flinders Street is the world's busiest railroad station. Much of the new building in Melbourne portrays an aggressive modernity. Structures like the Royal Melbourne Hospital, one of the most up-to-date in the world, for instance. Its first occupants were the United States Medical Corps during the Pacific War. And suburban homes and apartments are just as up-to-date. The small but pleasant Yarra River yields its own peculiar beauties to the Sunday afternoon tripper. Its glassy surface provides an ideal playground for the rowing enthusiasts. Here, each year, the head of the river regatta is held, when boat crews from cottages race for the title. But suppose we leave the city of the south for the northern cane fields of Queensland. The coastal plains of Queensland produce about 94% of Australia's sugar, and most of that comes from small, neat farms of 20 to 120 acres. Aristocrats of labor, Queensland cane cutters are capable of handling anything from five to eight tons of cane a day. During the six to eight month harvesting season, cane cutters make a very high wage. The men work in gangs, neatly piling the cut cane to ensure that no one pile is more than a strong man can carry. The sugar industry is unique in that Australia is the only country in the world that grows and processes sugarcane profitably by labor that is paid at the wage levels of other industries. The sugarcane is taken to the mills by little wheezing, panting steam engines that labor lustily with their load. There are about 33 mills in Queensland and almost half, including the biggest, are cooperatively owned. Australia produces about 800,000 tons of sugar a year, and could produce more. The capital of the sugar state, Brisbane, straddles the Brisbane River about 20 miles from its mouth. With a population of half a million, it is steadily gaining in importance in Australia's industrial scene. Dominating it architecturally are its great city hall and municipal offices. Brisbane's subtropical climate contrasts with the climate of other Australian capital cities. Parliament House is the seat of the state government. The World War I memorial carries an eternally burning flame which typifies the undying spirit of the Australian fighting man. The Story Bridge opens the way to suburban Brisbane, and across the river there are homes very different from those of other cities' suburban area. The modern comfortable houses are mostly built of wood and usually stand high on piles. This form of architecture allows the maximum circulation of air during the hot, humid summer, and you don't have to worry about winter in Brisbane. It doesn't have one. Flowers bloom all the year round in Brisbane, as they do in all Australian gardens. 
But Brisbane's tropical trees, shrubs and creepers are particularly exotic. At the other extreme, there is the southern state of Tasmania, an island. With its rugged forest-clad mountains and its cool temperate climate, Tasmania has preserved an English air. Its capital, Hobart, is Australia's second oldest city and has one of the world's finest deep river harbors. The city has long been the export point for Tasmania's famous apples and the trade makes Hobart a prosperous city and its prosperity has been further expanded by the surrounding forests which provide the timber for a growing pulp and paper industry. Timber of a different kind is found to the west among the hardwood forests of Western Australia. Jarrah is probably the best known of Australia's hardwood timbers. Indeed, it is one of the hardest timbers in the world. The flags warn anyone who approaches that trees are being felled. As the treetop trembles and the gash in the trunk opens, there comes the cry, she's going. Jarrah is not the biggest of Australian eucalypts. It averages about 120 to 140 feet. Carrie, for instance, is twice as high, and the Victorian mountain ashes have been measured at nearly 400 feet. The Jarrah's a heavy haul just the same. Tramways with quaint old engines haul the logs to the mill. Western Australia has about three million acres of forests, and the center through which her hardwood wealth is handled is her capital, Perth. Perth spreads over both shores of the Swan River, about 12 miles from Fremantle, the port at its mouth. It has a population of about 300,000, and although it is a thriving business center, Perth has a thousand-acre bushland park within walking distance of the heart of the city. But if there is one thing that the people of Perth are more proud of than their park with its magnificent array of wild flowers and orchids, it's their university. The University of Western Australia is the nation's only wholly free university. Its buildings present a dignified blending of traditional university design and modern architecture. But perhaps the most remarkable feature about Australia today is the development that has taken place in her secondary industries. Modern factories have sprung up in every city and in scores of country centers too. Newly constructed plants have poured out motors, planes, and ships. Some experts have estimated that Australia grew industrially 50 years in the six years of World War II. From mines like these, men are hewing the ore, drilling the coal, taking from great caverns under the earth almost every mineral known to science. In recent years, the Australian output of at least 20 minerals has reached a record total. Vast masses of modern machinery handle the crude ores from the time they are pried from the earth until they finally find their way to the vat and the furnace heat. Australia has proved that she can produce high-class steel more cheaply than either Great Britain or the United States. She is finding her place in world markets as an industrial nation in her own right. Goods, manufactured goods, for all corners of the nation, are loaded at marshalling yards like these in Sydney. Sydney, Australia's largest and busiest city, with a population of a million and a half, stands on one of the greatest natural harbors in the world. Planning gave it its rich parks and gardens. The sunshine they afford make them a popular sandwich rendezvous at lunchtime. busy city. Compatriots from other states liken it to a little New York, where everyone seems to be in a hurry to get somewhere.
Sydney offers a greater variety of transport than other Australian cities. Apart from the inevitable streetcar, there's the bus and the train that crosses Sydney's Great Harbour Bridge. But the foreshore dweller is faithful to his ferry. It's fast, comfortable, and, well, you know there's nothing like a sea trip, even if it only lasts 10 minutes. Of course, you can do a lot better than that, because Sydney Harbour boasts nearly 200 miles of foreshore. Its great main basin can accommodate the world's largest ships. Middle Harbour separates two of Sydney's popular residential areas, and scenes like this one, overlooking the spit at Mossman, can be duplicated from hundreds of lounge room windows and verandas. Saturday and Sunday boat races are the order for young and old, and even the weekend fishermen don't mind much. But let's move inland to Canberra, erect according to a plan for a model city selected from a worldwide entry list. Canberra combines official decorum with free and easy living. Keystone of the entire Canberra plan is Parliament House. Here are the Institute of Anatomy and the Modern High School. And overlooking the entire scene is the National War Memorial. Government offices are well planned, and because of their centralized positions, most public servants are able to get home for lunch. And if the bus is a bit overcrowded, do you think they care? Bicycles are popular with everyone, from the undersecretary to the postal clerk. Well planned houses, almost all government owned, make Canberra not only a beautiful, but a healthy city too. And the health and the future of these sturdy young Australians is one of the country's greatest concerns. Baby health centers give advice and assistance to mothers in even the most remote parts. There are funds for preschool kindergartens and day nurseries in every populated center. This time, we're going to visit a different kind of school. Routine classes aren't ignored here, but the sponsors of this system believe that it's at least as important for boys and girls to know about the world they live in as it is for them to know about the ancient authors of Greece and Rome, or say, pass the butter please in French. But take a look at this. You'll have guessed by this time that Kilmany Park is well out in the country. So, as well as learning the three R's, these kiddies are receiving a sound basic training in the life that many of them will live when school days are behind them. They're away to a flying start, and they certainly look happy about it. This type of school is rapidly spreading in rural areas. The results they have achieved have attracted attention of educators the world over. Education in Australia is free and compulsory, and both government schools and private colleges prepare students for university entrance. Universities which have produced many of today's leaders in law, medicine and research are situated in each of the Australian capital cities. Each state carries a scholarship system and other benefit plans that enable any talented student to go through university. And so Australian youth can look forward to the future with confidence and faith in the nation their fathers have built.